Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at First Baptist Church of Gazoo City. With all choices you have to make today, I am honored that you have chosen to worship with us in the comfort of your home. As you sit back, would you also participate in the service and allow the Lord to transform your life? For that's why we are here today. Thank you again for joining us. May God bless you today. Well, good morning. Thank you for being here today. And uh, you are the quietest that we've had people in here all week long. Thank you for the honor of letting your kids come this week. And uh, you're going to get to see a little bit of what they learned over this past week. Uh, as we do songs, these are not just random songs that we did, but these were actually songs that tied into the lesson. For we talked about that God created us for a relationship, and that relationship was broken because of sin. And so the Lord promised that that, that relationship would be restored through Jesus. And Jesus came and died on the cross for us so we could make that decision and respond to have that relationship restored. And then he continues to go with us through his Holy Spirit. And so the songs you will, should be able to pick up will follow along those same themes. And while it is time for our kids to show what they learned, this is also to be a time of worship. It's time for you to be proud of your kids, but it's a time for us to exalt God. 
And that's the main reason we're here today. So let's pray together as we begin. And let's ask the Lord to bless the time that we have together today. Father, we thank you for the love and the grace that you have demonstrated for us and the privilege that we have to be here today. We are thankful for what you did in the lives of these boys and girls this past week and what you did in the lives of us as, as adults that were here. And Lord, now we want to just celebrate what they learned, but most importantly, we want to celebrate you. For you made all of this possible. For you came and restored a broken relationship so that we could know you personally. So God, be pleased with this worship, we pray. Prepare our hearts to hear from you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The relationship was perfect, but sin has never been in love.
Because it's week. A lot of them you'll see have the gray shirts with the design on it, but some of them uh, don't. And I guess they've worn it four or five days and had lost interest by that point. Couldn't get to the washing machine. <laughs> but if you'll stand, all those of you that, that work at Vacation Bible Club School at some point, somewhere, if you'll stand, yeah, these are the ones. Amen. Thank you. They're the real, they're the real heroes. We had 191 kids that came, and uh, so yeah. So it was a, a great outreach. We had a lot of things going on. So when you see these folks, uh, make sure you thank them, and then get ready to sign up for next year because we anticipate a lot more. All right, we're going to stand together. And we're going to sing "God of Wonders Beyond Our Galaxy." Would you stand with me and let's sing together, kids? You find your parents too. So on this time, I want us to turn our attention to God's Word in John chapter 21. If you would take your copy of God's Word, it would be on the wall behind me, John chapter 21. As we come to John 21, Jesus has been 
resurrected. So it means Jesus has already died on the cross for our sins so that we could have a relationship with him. Three days later, he rose again, defeating sin and defeating death. But the Lord didn't just arise and see a couple of folks and go to heaven. He didn't just arise and go straight to heaven. But he spent some time on earth taking care of some business. And one of the things he had to do was restore relationship with a man named Peter. See, Peter had denied Jesus three times. He had professed, Lord, all these other people may leave you, they may forsake you, but you can count on me. I will follow you even to the point of death. And Jesus told Peter, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You would think that if the Lord told you that, that would wake you up, but it didn't. And so Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus was crucified, and Peter has lived with that guilt. And all of us here today have some failure in our life where we can understand Peter. We understand what it's like to have the guilt, the shame, the heartache that's there. We have the scars to prove the mistake that we made. But we don't have to stay there. For as this exchange that we're going to read, the Lord restores Peter. And that is the decision that each of us must face today. And we must answer, what will we do to overcome our failure. Notice in John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15, we're told, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. A third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you would stretch out your hands and someone else would dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Jesus turned, or Peter turned, and saw the other disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? And Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, What is that to you? You must follow me. The story is told of two Kentucky horse racing stable owners who developed a keen rivalry among each other. Each year they would enter a horse into the local race and they could never win. And so they decided it was time to step up the game a little bit. One of them thought that hiring a professional jockey might would help him and so that's indeed what he did he went out he found this professional jockey he began to train with the horse and the day the race finally came and this one man knew that he was going to win he knew his competition would be the man who had always competed against him their horses were in stalls one and two the horses took off they began to go around the track and the last turn horse number three bumped into horse two that bumped into horse one and knocked horse one against the fence and horses one and two both fell knocking the jockeys off of them the professional jockey was prepared for that he had trained for that moment he jumped back on the horse he took off he crossed the finish line victorious he celebrated but he kept wondering where the owner was He got the prize, he got everything they gave him, and he got back to the stall, and he found the owner furious. He said, sir, what's wrong? Didn't I win the race? He says, yes, you won the race, but you got back on the wrong horse. That jockey had the best of intentions. He intended to win the race, but he became distracted from the task. Ultimately, he failed and what he was trying to do. And oftentimes, we find ourselves in the same place in our relationship with the Lord. We start out strong with the best of intentions. But at some point, we become distracted. We lose our way. We get knocked down, and we get back on the wrong thing. And this was true of Peter. 
But before we beat ourselves up for our failures, Theodore Roosevelt once said that the only man who never makes a mistake is the man who never does anything. That's all of us. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Many of you, I wouldn't have to go back very far. It was tough to get your kids up and get here this morning. You fought and you hollered and you did everything within your power to make the morning smooth, but it may not have been very smooth this morning. And as you sit here, you're thinking, you know what? We came to church and the kids were smiling, but I blew it today. You're not alone. Maybe something else you're thinking about that went on yesterday or went on at work this week. Those mistakes are in the forefront oftentimes of our mind. That's the ugly reality of life. But a careful study of the Bible reveals that the great figures of our faith experienced failure from one time or another. Yet those failures did not keep them from effective service for the Lord. If we look back through the history of the Bible, we see that Moses failed. Abraham failed, David failed, Elijah failed. These are heroes of the faith, and then we put Peter in the mix of them. Though they failed, and they failed often in very significant ways, they not only recovered from their failure, but they used it as a tool of growth. And that's the decision that you and I face today. Failure does not have to be final. How can we grow from our failure? Well, there's some keys, three keys to recovering this morning. The first key that we see from this passage that we must consider no superior. See, prior to this, Peter and the disciples have gone fishing. That was the family business for at least four of the men. Peter and Andrew, James and John. Four fishermen who left everything to follow Jesus, left the family business. And this may have been a casual outing with the guys, it's not known. But as professional fishermen, they would have at least entertained the thoughts of going back to their former work. Especially, I would have to thank Peter, for he's the one that has failed and that we have known now throughout history of his failure. The temptation to go back and just forget all the stuff that Jesus talked about, forget about this following me stuff, and just go back and fish for a living and be more comfortable than he had been in the three years he'd been following Jesus with ridicule and persecution along the way. But also at the back of his mind, he knew that following Jesus had been great. It must have been wonderful for him to know that Jesus was alive once again. But now, what's next? A fellow has to make a living. So they're out fishing, and Jesus appears. He tells them to cast their net to the other side of the boat. And they do, and they catch catch so many fish after not catching any all night that they couldn't even drag the nets up. And John speaks up, and he says, look, it's Jesus. And Peter, the impulsive guy that he is, jumps in the water and swims to Jesus. He couldn't wait for the boat to get up there because he knew he had a relationship that needed to be restored. And then Jesus fixes breakfast for him. And man, there's a scriptural reason you can have fish for breakfast. That's what they had. And then we come to verse 15. When Jesus looked at Peter... Now imagine, Peter has been waiting for this moment. This is one of those moments, parents, of wait till we get home. He knows the time is coming. He knows Jesus is going to ask the questions. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? He would ask him two other times, do you love me? Do you love me? But more than these, he's asking him at that moment, Peter, are you willing to say that I am superior in your life? Do you love me more than these? It's been debated for years what the more than these is. Many believe it's the boats and the fish. That Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than this lucrative business that you could go back into? Others believe it's the men that are around, around Peter. Do you love me more than you love these guys in the time that you can spend with them on the lake making a living for yourself? Do you love me more than your fishing career and the buddies that are with you? See, Jesus is calling Peter to make a choice at that moment. Does he love his career or is he willing to be Christ's disciple with a specific ministry to care for sheep? 
Jesus is calling Peter to determine, to determine what is superior to him. Do you love me more than these? But it's also possible that he's asking Peter, do you really love me more than these other guys? Because remember, it was Peter who spoke up when Jesus predicted his betrayal, who said that he would be faithful even if the others fell away. John records Peter saying, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. And then he denies Jesus three times. But in the present setting, Jesus is the one who knows all things. And he understands that, this, that despite his failure, Peter is a man of faith and a man of commitment. And so Jesus may very well be asking him, Do you indeed love me more than these other men love me? With those questions... Do you love me more than these? Whether it's the fishing career, his buddies, or the men who stand before him saying, compare your life to them. Do you love me more than they do? Jesus is challenging Peter to ask himself who or what is going to be first in his life. And that's the decision that each of us must make. And we will never recover from failure unless the Lord is first. We like to be on top. And so oftentimes we consider ourselves superior to someone else. The thing about areas we do is we like to think that our sports teams are superior. But let's face it, most of our teams are from Mississippi, mine's from Arkansas. We're not really superior to anybody. We're just kind of average. We may think, okay, I, my, my career is superior to someone else. My education is superior. My possessions are superior. My spouse is superior. My family is superior. We could list all these things that we would say that to the average eye, we are on top. And we brag about those things. We love to be superior. But I want to ask you today, if we could lay everything in our life out in the open, everything that we've achieved, all that we have, all of our possessions, our careers, our relationships, if we laid it all out in the open, what would be most superior? What would be most important to you? Now we should say in this setting that it's the Lord, right? And that should be in true, true indeed for each one of us. But for most we would say, you know what, if I'm honest, my family is the superior in my life. I, everything I do my, is driven by my family. Or my work, climbing the ladder at work, or just bringing home the paycheck to meet the needs for my family, those things are superior in my life. So they don't have to be bad things, but they can be other things other than the Lord. And when those are superior in our life, we will never recover from failure. Instead, we will have one failure on top of another, on top of another, for the duration of our life. And to recover from failure, we have to come to the conclusion that nothing is more important than Jesus. Some children made that decision this week. When they placed their faith in Jesus Christ, they admitted that they were a sinner. They believed Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and they confessed their love for him. And maybe today you're there and going, that's what I need to do. See, if you've never done that, you will never get over failure because it's when we admit and believe and confess that we experience grace. We experience God's love. And Scripture tells us that his grace covers a multitude of sins. That's everything, multitude. That's what I've got, and that's what you've got. So today, who is first in your life? We must consider no superior. Secondly, we must care for everyone. See, Peter answers in the affirmative to each question, Yes, Lord, I love you. You know that I love you. And then Jesus responds, Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. There's a command to each response that Peter gives. Now in his response, Peter is committed that there is nothing more superior than Jesus in his life. So then Jesus commissions him to take care of his people. See, throughout Scripture, there's the analogy of the Lord being the shepherd and we are the sheep. And Jesus called himself the good shepherd. And he knows his sheep. He knows them by name and they know his voice and they respond to his voice. What Jesus is saying is, Peter, I'm not going to be here forever. You are now charged with taking care of the sheep. 
that the shepherd is leaving, he's going to heaven, and he gives us the responsibility to care for each other. Because of this interaction here, I can easily conclude that you cannot profess a love for Jesus without a love for his church. Peter and each one of us, when we profess our love for Christ, is called to embrace the body of Christ, to love it, to tend to it, and to protect it. That this becomes our command as well. When we answer the question the Lord asks of us, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than everything else in your life? Do you love me more than the other stuff? Am I superior in your life? When we answer that yes, then the response is, feed my sheep. Take care of my people. That's why we all need to belong to a local church, a place where we attend, yes, but more than just attending, that we participate in and that we support its ministries in and that we bring others to be a part of that body of Christ. That's the process of caring for the Lord's sheep. And we cannot say, yes, Lord, I love you, without caring for the sheep. It's not either or, it's both. The movie Hoosiers is probably one of the most famous sports stories telling the Cinderella story of a small town Indiana high school basketball team that wins a state championship. But there's a, one character in the story. It's an alcoholic named Scooter. Not Scooter, excuse me, Shooter. There we go, Shooter. Shooter has failed at most things in his life. Shooter, though, has an extraordinary knowledge of and passion for the game of basketball. And the coach wants Shooter to be an assistant coach. Shooter feels like he cannot do that. His son does not want him to do it. Feels like he's not qualified to be there. He's embarrassed by his dad and by his dad's actions. He really wants him to have nothing to do with it. But the coach talks Shooter into being the assistant coach. At one point in the movie, after Shooter has had another night of binge drinking, he coach tells him, I'll give you another chance. And the shooter begs, please never get thrown out of the game. So one particular game, the coach is questioning the call. He's hollering at the official, and then he grabs the official by the arm and says, throw me out of the game. Coaches usually don't request that of officials. So the official kind of looked perplexed, and the coach said it again, throw me out of the game. And so that's what happens. The coach is thrown out, and now Shooter is in charge. The boys huddle around Shooter, and he's scared to death. He doesn't know what to say. His son finally speaks up and says, Dad, do you think they're going to give the ball to number four? And Shooter comes up with a little bit of a play. He sends the boys back out, and then he gets in the game. Shortly thereafter, he calls timeout once again. And now he's in full tune, and he tells them what the play they're going to run. He's now in charge. He sends them out. They execute the play. They score the winning basket. And in the moment of elation of celebrating the victory, Shooter's son comes, and he grabs his father, and he looks his father in the eyes, and he says, You did good, Pop. You did real good. See, a weak, shame-filled alcoholic did real good because there was a coach that decided he was worth taking a risk on. And in the same way, God sees our value. And his love for us, he determines that you and that me are enough to take a risk on. And then he calls us to do the same. To take a risk on those that are filled with shame. That the way their sin is burying them down. And to invest in their lives and to care for everyone. And that happens within the church. Listen to me, if you're here today, maybe for the first time, or it's been a while, you need to understand that we are just a group of healed men and women who understand our personal stories and our personal handicaps, but we've been forgiven and transformed by the Spirit of God. That's all the church is. And when we understand that, we love the church because we love Jesus. We care for everyone. See, so oftentimes we try to get over our failure and we focus on ourselves. But instead we need to focus upon the Lord and when we focus upon Him, we focus upon others as well. 
The third key to recovering from failure is to follow the one. See, Jesus goes on to describe what Peter's life will be like. He says, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. He's basically saying, when you were younger, you were in charge. But now you're no longer in charge. Now that you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. So Jesus is describing the turns that Peter's life would take. That this brash, independent, vocal fisherman would one day become dependent on the Lord. He would be a prisoner and he would die for his faith. Only the Son of God could share that with somebody and tell them basically, you're going to lose your life for me, and then immediately look at them and say, follow me. Those were the same words that Jesus said the first time he called Peter. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. With those words, Peter's understanding that his mistake did not change God's call for his life. And that's what you and I need to understand today. Regardless of our failures, God's call does not change. He's still saying, come, follow me. And then Peter apparently glances over his shoulder. And he sees John, the writer of this passage, who says, who calls himself the one that Jesus loved. And he says, Lord... What about him? With that question, he's telling Jesus, if I have to die, so does John. If I have to face that death, he's got to face it as well. But Jesus kind of rebukes him. Don't worry about anybody else. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Jesus is telling him, it's none of your business about anybody else. But you must follow me. The main thing is that each of us should follow Christ as he calls us. And none of our calls are going to be the same. Yes, the call to salvation, to trust him, is all the same. But then how God works in our life after that is different for each one of us. As he uses our personalities and our passions and our gifts and our experiences, none of us are going to be used the same. And we must focus on us. We must follow Him. You know, this week reminds me of how one child will follow another. I forget that kids line up to go do everything. And so it would come time I, I helped teach the fifth and sixth grade class, and all right, let's go to the next place. And they would line up at the door. And then I noticed this with all the other classes. We go downstairs, and we were heading over to the fellowship hall. So we had to cross the alley, and every teacher would tell their class, do not run. <laughs> yeah. The first few wouldn't run because the teacher was there. But then one, usually a little boy, somebody would run. And the kid behind him would run because they had to keep up, Right? And then the next one's running. And before long, there's 190 kids running down the alley. Why? Because one ran. <laughs> but we can learn something from that. We have so many things competing for our time and our attention, competing for our trust. But we must follow the one. And when the Lord Jesus is in front of our life, when he is the leader of our life, when he runs, we run. When he walks, we walk. When he stops, we stop. Where he goes, we go. How he speaks, we speak. How he thinks, we think. And we follow that one. And that will only happen until we consider no superior. And we care for everyone. And we understand the Lord calls each one of us, follow me. And that only happened until we do, as the writer of Hebrews says, that we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sits now at the right hand of God the Father. Who today are you following? What are you following? See, what amazes me about this whole passage is that Peter was willing to face his fear or face his failure in the presence of Jesus. 
Because if I were Peter, and I was on the boat, and John said, look, there's Jesus. I would have to think, in my mind, I would think, can we put the boat out the other direction? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid to encounter him. But Peter faced that fear. He ran, swam, and ran to the shore to be in the presence of Jesus, to face his failure. All of us have things that we would rather die than everybody in this room to know about. And many times we allow those things to keep us from the Lord. But today you can face that failure in his presence as he promises through his spirit to meet with us here. Today, what do you need to do to recover from failure? Which of these three things, or maybe all of them, do you need to do? Because it boils down to the call, follow me. You must follow me. Are you following the Lord today? That's the question I want each of us to answer. Are we truly following him? Would you bow with me? And with heads bowed and eyes closed, here in just a minute, we're going to have a moment of invitation. We're going to stand and we're going to sing, and it's a time for you to respond publicly if God is calling you to do so. Some of you here, again, you've never placed your faith in Jesus. Maybe your kids have come home and they've sang about admitting and believing and confessing, but that's it. There, there's never been anything else. And today could be the day when you need to make that decision, when you admit to God that you're a sinner. And you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and he rose three days later. And you confess, you acknowledge your love for him. If that's you today, would you just cry that out? Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I need you. I believe today, Lord, that I surrender my life to you. Maybe you're so wrapped up in your life, your family, your career, that you can't care for everyone. You're not a part of a local body of believers, not a part of a church. And that needs to be your commitment today, to be a part of a place where you can grow together. And as parents, you can lead your children in the ways of the Lord through his body. Whatever the case is, none of us can leave here today without deciding what will we do with what we've heard. Whether it's a public decision that you need to come forward as we're standing here, or you need to answer God's call just between you and him, but you need to share that with someone. Someone that can hold you accountable. Someone that can tell you the next step. Tell you what you need to do. Someone who can encourage you. So today, would you be prepared to respond? Father God, would you give your peace in this place to those whom you're dealing with today? Lord, we come and we're so thankful that you accept us with our failures. So as we come here today, Father, let us not run from you, but run to you. Let us experience your grace in a fresh way today. Lord, there are some here who need to place their faith in you. Others who need to take the next step in that journey with you. Lord, let us all answer the call to follow you completely. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together? As we sing, I will be here. Aaron will be here. If there's a way in which we can minister to you, would you please come as we sing? At this time, our service is a time for those in attendance to make public decisions as a response to hearing God's word and holding it in their life. Maybe the Lord has spoken to you today, and there's a decision that you need to make, or some questions that you need to answer, or just some guidance that you need for some things you're facing in life. I'd like to invite you to call 888-JESUS-20 where you will be linked up with a counselor who can give you direction regarding the decisions that you need to make. You're also welcome to call us here at the church office on Monday morning, 746-2471. But I encourage you not to delay, not to wait until that time, but to right now take the time to make the decisions in your life which God is leading you to make. Again, that number is 888-JESUS-20.
that you keep our eyes and on the one and to follow the one Lord we've heard you speak to us today through uh, uh, through the reading of your word through the message Lord and God I just thank you for speaking to us through these wonderful children that we have here Lord you are a gracious God and we want to praise you through giving our offering and our tithes Lord we just you have blessed us so richly father help our help us to truly honor you by sharing of what you have given us in thy name I ask it amen Thank you for being here today. It's our honor to have you here. I hope you were planning to stay for lunch as we go. If you will go out and around. Uh, if you have kids from VBS that are ready to get their bags with their crafts and things in them, our teachers will be lined up here on, uh, toward the end of this building out here toward the alley. You can just go to their class, their teacher. They should recognize them. They will dig through the box and give them their bag. And then if you'll continue to walk around uh, to the end of the block and hang a right and come in that entrance, to the first door you'll come to uh, in the gym, the food is set up there. When you come out, 
you'll go to the fellowship hall, and it's close seating in there. If you would, go all the way to the front, fill in from the front. Uh, when that fills up, there is some overflow seating uh, there close to the gym. But let's fill the fellowship hall up first, and look forward to spending this time with you today. It's been our honor, again, to have your kids here. It's our honor to have you here today, and we pray that you will come back and join us soon. We'd love to have you as we gather Wednesday. You see our schedule there and the things that are going on, uh, special for our youth and our children. Um, and then as we gather next Sunday as well. It's always great to be in the Lord's house. I spoke of some children who had made the decision to change their life, to place their faith in Jesus Christ uh, this past week. And Noah was one of those. So Noah, if you would come here, uh, I'm going to tell you something. Any time to walk down here is huge. But to walk down here today, when there's all these folks, is, is awesome. And that shows you the genuineness of the commitment that he's made. Uh, to share with you that he has placed his faith in Jesus Christ and desires to take the first step and be obedient in baptism to that. And uh, I want you to see something. Look out this way. It's, some of them are not very pretty. Look, well, never mind. Uh, kind of look over this guy sitting here and stuff. But uh, if, if I want you to demonstrate to him, number one, that we're proud of the decision that he's made. Number two, we're thankful that God gives us grace, but that you're going to pray for him and you're going to encourage him. And as a sign of that, would you raise your right hand and keep those up? And you see all these folks that are proud of you today. You can put those down. And uh, as we wrap up, I want you to come by after we sing our song and let him know, church, just how proud of him that you are. And so mom can come stand up here because it is a rough crew. But y'all can sit there for the time being. Let's stand together. And we're going to declare as we sing, as we leave today, how great is our God. As we conclude, that's the end of our service. We look forward to fellowshipping with you today. How great is our God.